All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome and good morning, and welcome to DrupalCon. Um, my presentation today, as you can see, is titled The Story of Energy.gov The Ins and Outs of Turning Energy.blah into Energy.awesome. Um, before we get started this morning, I wanted to take a few minutes to actually tell you a little bit about myself um, and some of my experience. So uh, I've been in this, uh, this intersection of politics and public service and uh, digital strategy for about a decade now. I've held a variety of positions um, <laughs> uh, across that decade from being a field director using digital tools to being a campaign manager um, to being on co uh, communications and research teams to also doing um, online fundraising and advocacy for, for some of our most popular um, nationwide nonprofits. Um, most recently, um, I uh, directed uh, digital rapid response um, in 2008 for the Obama campaign. Uh, what this was is that I had a SWAT team of writers, engineers, um, designers, videographers that worked with me to build uh, digital products that we could use to influence uh, the news cycle. Um, after that, uh, I moved on to the White House um, and uh, was um, the deputy new media director there, where I helped to build out the first uh, new media department at the White House um, with our director there, Macon Phillips. And then after that, I moved on to where I am currently uh, serving at a cabinet level agency at the Department of Energy, where I serve as a, a senior advisor and director of uh, digital strategy and communications. And uh, the focus of my presentation today is going to be uh, about my experience there and building out digital strategy there. So this is the, the, the business side of me. So let me tell you a little bit more about the behind the scenes um, part of me. Um, there's five favorite things that I have in, uh, uh, that I love in this world. One is puppies. Two is the Pittsburgh Steelers. Three is Journey, the greatest band ever. Uh, four is wine. And last but not least is my, is my husband over there in, in that particular order. Now, I'm sure in all fairness, that once he realizes that's the photo I use, I will drop from his top five into his top ten. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, now down to business. Things that I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to be giving a kind of a 10,000 foot view of the strategies that we employed to build a enterprise platform at the Department of Energy. Now, what you will not hear in this presentation are the specific details of our Drupal instance. If you want those answers, I am happy to direct you towards the front of the room where our engineering team happens to be sitting. Um, <laughs> um, rather, I, I want to focus today on all the different pieces that we had to pull together in order um, uh, to, to achieve this. So I'll be focusing on uh, resource strategy, um, so, uh, uh, what we use to develop the team and put together the team to build an um, enterprise platform, to our content strategy, what we wanted to build, and last but not least, the business strategy to help us execute. So, energy.blah. When I started at the Department of Energy a couple of years ago, uh, two years exactly in May, um, this is the site um, that greeted me. Um, if the purpose of this site was to uh, house all of the logos um, at the Department of Energy on the homepage, it succeeds. There's at least 21, if you want to count them, 21 on the homepage. Um, however, it didn't succeed at much else. Um, the Department of Energy uh, plays such a vital role um, in our nation, uh, building the clean energy economy and developing our energy portfolio with an all above uh, strategy, um, protecting our nu uh, nu uh, national nuclear security, and expanding the frontiers of our knowledge in science and technology, these are very critical and important things that the Department of Energy does. But in no way does this site tell that story. And it doesn't even, uh, and it doesn't just not tell it in an aesthetic way, and, and also with its content, but the, the, the platform that supports it also prohibits us from telling that story. So this, um, this brings me to what I call, what we uncovered, and what I've now called, uh, uh, coined, the Etch-a-Sketch problem. Um, the, the site I just showed you, the energy.blah, was actually redone um, in 2006. And I, think it was, I believe it was the first time that energy.gov had moved to a content management system. And that system at the time you know, was good for very specific things. Um, if you wanted to go up and down, or left and right, or like post a press release, take it down, you could do that really well. Just like an etch sketch you can do those things really well. And if you were really good and you practiced really hard, um, you can make a pretty good circle. Well, if you got really good at working with the, the content management system, you can maybe post a video and expect it to play, sometimes. 
Um, so what we quickly uncovered was that the CMS we were using wasn't going to be able to adapt and be flexible enough to meet the communication demands um, of the environment that we were in. And we needed something that would. So we needed something that was going to be flexible. Um, to um, add to this problem, I want to play a little game. So when I was in second grade, um, we, had, we played this game where we had jelly beans in a jar, and we guessed how many jelly beans were in the jar, and we got all the jelly beans. Now, this is, we're going to play a similar game, except if you guess the number of websites correctly, you will not get all of the websites. I will save you that. Um, so how many websites uh, do you guys think the Department of Energy has? Who said that? OK, it's pretty good. <laughs> That's close. Any other guesses? 50? 350? 402. You guys are good. Oh, way, way back there? 2,000? <laughs> Are, are you guys actually counting the number of etch sketches in there? Um, so the federal government, uh, so this is actually quite a complicated question to answer. Um, the federal government um, manages 24 to 25,000 second level .gov domains. The Department of Energy um, uh, is responsible for approximately 87 of those. Within those 87, there are several other web, uh, websites. Um, and we, you know, have done a couple of data calls. And to our best estimate, we have approximately 359 websites that the Department of Energy manages or runs. That's a lot. So in thinking about um, the web presence for the Department of Energy and how we could really elevate and improve um, um, the user experience and digital communications as a whole and also elevate these other um, sites that have similar experiences of whether being in an outdated CMS or not being at CMS at all, how can we elevate everybody? So, and we needed something that was going to be flexible and could scale to many different requirements. So this brings in um, our solution, the energy.gov platform. We wanted something, again, that was going to be flexible and scale to many different requirements. Some of them we knew, some of them were, uh, uh, you know, we, we learned along the way, and others that we don't yet, ha haven't yet uncovered. In addition, so I mentioned that the last, the energy.blah that was launched, um, um, that, I, that, that I came into, that was redone in 2006, and in just such a few short years, it became outdated and inflexible and wasn't meeting our needs. So it was also going to be very important to find a solution that was going to be able to evolve as rapidly as our users' needs were evolving. And this is why we moved towards an open source solution that was going to be flexible, scalable, and evolve, over, and evolve rapidly over time. Something that Dries said in his presentation, a continuous innovation. Um, so this helped us develop the vision of what, of, of what we wanted to achieve. And that is developing a single platform solution via energy.gov for the Energy uh, Department's public-facing headquarter websites. So there's a little bit of government-y language in this, and that's the public-facing headquarter websites that I'll explain. Um, there's there's uh, you know, a vast um, array of uh, rules and regulations and um, um, organization a uh, complex organization that makes up um, uh, the energy department. This vision helps us have a clear focus on, on th something that we can achieve and succeed at and helps us um, hone in on that goal so that we can be successful. Um, along the way, and a, 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 when you're in the federal space, there's a lot of things that you can direct your energy and attention to to fixing. Um, we've been approached about fixing um, um, our intranets because we have a lot of those as well. Um, you know, our, our data processes, our, uh, how we execute multimedia projects. But we wanted to, um, we didn't want to tackle, um, uh, break off more than we, we could chew. So this vision helped us um, um, give us a laser focus on something that if we dedicated our resources or time and energy to and didn't let other things get in the way, we would have that initial success and be able to build upon that later. So this vision developed. Now um, I'm going to need some help to achieve it. So I got to build a team. I need some resources. So have you guys seen the Moneyball? I love this movie. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't think I'm giving anything away. Basically, Billy Bean is uh, uh, struck with this problem that he keeps trying to compete in the same way for building a team. And that, um, and by, by executing on that same strategy, he keeps losing. He keeps getting the same result. So he's going to change things up and build a team in a different way um, to be victorious and get the win. So I wanted to... Uh, uh, um, I wanted to take that same approach. We need to rethink how we were um, getting the resources and building the team that we needed to build this successful enterprise platform. 
Um, so I didn't want to go, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't want to follow the normal, you know, pro, like, uh, uh, go with the, uh, the normal uh, vendors um, or the new uh, or folks that have already been doing this. Because last I checked, a lot of folks think, I, you know, thought or think federal websites suck. So we wanted to change that. First and foremost, I developed um, an office of digital strategy responsible for uh, owning the web presence of the Department of Energy. Now, before this, um, our public affairs office, you know, they, they handled content, and our office, uh, uh, our chief information officer, owned the, owned the technology. However, no one was waking up every day thinking, how can we do this better? How can we better meet uh, the needs of, uh, of our audiences? Um, and so, without having a clear owner, uh, the result was 21 logos on the homepage of energy.gov. Um, so we developed an office of digital strategy that was that, that was empowered to own that digital presence, and that team consists of an editorial team of digital communication specialists that focus on energy issue areas, cur uh, curating content from across the department and elevating that on our top level energy.gov pages. It includes our um, our multimedia team, um, which works on video, photography, uh, data visualizations, and infographics to help to help tell the story of, of our content. And it also includes our user experience um, and digital technology team, which um, also works very uh, very closely on our digital reform project. Now, um, um, this office, and this is actually everybody on the team. The, um, um, this office, one of the things I realized was it was going to be really hard uh, for us to um, recruit um, the level of an engineering talent in a rapid way that we needed for this project through the traditional hiring process um, in the federal government. In fact, it took, you know, it took me several months just to get our content specialist. And last I checked, Drupal engineers were going for a pretty high price on the market. So <laughs> I needed, uh, we needed some partners. So we reached out um, across the Department of Energy and found um, a partner that was willing to work with us to get the top level of talent that we were looking for, and that was Energy Enterprises Solutions, EES, um, who was going to work with us to help us achieve this vision. And with them, they helped us find Blackmush to do our cloud hosting. Um, with, and they have specific experience in doing um, Drupal cloud hosting. Um, Acquia, um, who provides us with some, uh, our Drupal maintenance um, and support services as well as Treehouse, um, our uh, uh, Drupal engineering strategist and team. And the funny thing is about, uh, about Treehouse is at the time when we were working with EES, it came down to phase two in Treehouse and we didn't really know who to go with. And today I'm pleased, to, I'm excited to know that now that they've combined forces, so I now get the best of both worlds. <laughs> so that's good news. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we partnered with Huge for user experience and design. Um, and what, and uh, you know, some of the key things about this is that these um, these weren't the uh, uh, you know, traditional folks that um, um, that had been working on web projects um, in the Department of Energy. The, um, in, in some cases, for example, huge. It was the only government project that they ever had heard about. So we did uh, working with ES. We did a lot of work to recruit and find top-notch talent to help us build the platform that we knew we could, we, we could build. So. Um, this next part, decision making, a very important component of um, your resource strategy. So what I want to show a video, it's about four and a half minutes, um, it's funny so hopefully um, you'll fall asleep during it, that really kind of um, exemplifies you know, a typical decision making process in a large organization like the federal government. reports that people don't know what to do at an intersection. Some people are slowing, others are accelerating, a small percentage are backing up, and the rest are crashing. So we're looking for signage that makes people want to bring their vehicle to a standstill before they continue. Uh, essentially a sign that tells people to stop. Essentially. <laughs> if you look on page 16 of your brief, you'll notice that about 50% of HVMs are female. Yeah, HVMs. Uh, home vehicle uh, managers, but don't neglect the other 50% who are primarily male. Okay, so we're basically targeting all drivers? No, we're targeting women, but we're also targeting men secondarily. But really think this thing through if you could, okay? We're looking for stopping power. Yeah, I mean, and still get it by tomorrow. I love where you've taken this. You've 
guys nailed it. Yeah, I think this is pretty spot on. <laughs> Uh, having said that, uh, we're getting some additional details from upper management since the uh, initial briefing we gave you. I, I think we have the opportunity to make this piece hit a little harder. Yeah, harder. The main message is still the stopping occasion, but we're also going to need to include personal safety cues, uh, any appropriate right of way legal, uh, and our partner logos. And as far as red goes, we love it. But we got word from our creative standard group that the fire department kind of owns red, so we're going to have to uh, lighten it up on the Pantone scale. Lighten it up like pink? Based on our female target market, I don't see a downside. Yeah, well, what about our male secondary market? Maybe we do pink signs in the female intersection zones and blue ones in the male ones. And, and which intersections are the female ones? Hmm. I got it. Why don't you go with pink and blue until we get you an answer on that? Brilliant. Way to crack the code. I think we're done here. Sure. Uh, we just got word from the UN that we can't use our logo. Then let's bump up the EPA logo. Okay. I think somewhere on there we need to show the stopping occasion. It needs to be telegraphic. Yeah, some people just don't read, you know? It's great. Can we try a new line? I showed it to my daughter and she didn't really get it. Yeah, circles feel very 90s to me. Can we try a different shape, too? Can we try a softer headline, though? And a web address, in case people want more info? Maybe a burst that says new. If it doesn't make it too busy? I keep imagining a line of cars stacked up at the intersection. Yeah, I think we need a more complete call to action so people know exactly what to do after the pause. I'd also like to see maybe some people smiling on it. You know, to remind drivers that stopping isn't required, it's also fun. You guys got all that? Say, I think you finally got it. You guys did an amazing job of fitting all of our suggestions in on one sign. Can you throw together a look of success for a selling meeting this afternoon? And that's how it all comes together, guys. I mean, if I were at that intersection, I'd stop. Me too. I don't see how anyone couldn't. Let's get these things printed and out the door. Um, a little dark. <laughs> um, but you actually can see that there's a lot of similarities between that stop site at the end and um, uh, the homepage of energy.gov um, from 2006. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were doing something different to avoid this kind of group think. Um, so that we had clear decision making. Um, um, within our organization so that we were giving very clear guidance to all of our partners um, during the build. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, senior leadership at the Department of Energy um, gave me the ability to make, uh, to have de decision making authority on this project. In addition, I knew that I couldn't be uh, up to date with everything on the day to day. So I also um, um, relinquished some of that um, authority to um, our director of user experience and, um, um, and digital technology, Elizabeth Meckes, to um, make day to day decisions um, as needed um, in my absence to keep this project moving. And it's important to note that when you're even though you have a clear decision, make a decision maker, it doesn't mean that collaboration doesn't happen. It means that there is a time for it, but at the end of the day, somebody's making that decision and owning it and moving on. All right, so we have our team. What do we want them to build? Let's talk about content strategy. So our goal at the outset is a pretty ambitious one. We wanted to make energy.gov the resource for energy information and set a new standard for federal websites. We wanted to be different. We wanted to be bold. We wanted to make a statement, and we wanted, we wanted it to be really good. 
Um, going back to the mission of the Department of Energy, three main pillars of what we do, energy, science, and nuclear stewardship. So how we can connect all of those? We're going to connect all of them with public services, and here's why. Um, we, we can achieve our national priorities um, um, through uh, meeting an individual's needs. So when we look at our national, uh, you know, national and, and global issues, the way that an individual interacts with them is on a local level. And then they make decisions and influence it, those issues also on a local level. And then the, uh, at that local level, those local issues then influence the national priorities. So the result is when we address needs at the individual level, we can achieve our national goals. So another reason that we want to focus on the individual is that those talking about energy um, and the work that we do in, in the digital space, it's overwhelming. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of competition, a lot of noise. And one of the ways that we can break through with that is by focusing uh, our, our public services, our information at that individual level. Where it's going to be the most impactful. So with that goal in mind, um, we did a bunch of personas. Here's one. This is Pete. He's in Buffalo. He lives in Buffalo, New York. He's a contractor. He's 47. He's married. He has three kids, and he's looking for a new truck. And for those of uh, who, for those who have seen this persona, um, for you, Pete's been looking for a new truck for a long time. <laughs> so, how is Pete affected by energy policy? Uh, jobs, gas prices, utility prices, economy, neighborhood uh, issues, taxes, pollution, a variety of different ways. This is how it's. Uh, 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 energy issues are affecting Pete. What, what Pete cares about? Well, he cares about what a lot of us care about. He cares about his wallet, his job, his family, his town, and his nearby environment. What Pete doesn't know? He doesn't know how to save energy to save money. He doesn't know the sources of his power, and he doesn't know the cost of energy next year. There are uh, lots of things about his, um, um, his energy environment that he's, that he's just not aware of and is, is ill-equipped to make um, decisions on. So. We at the Department of Energy, we partner up uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency to provide Energy Star rebates. So we have this information um, about how to get energy efficient um, appliances, and we offer you an incentive to do so, a rebate. Um, this gives Pete the incentive of, of, of financial savings to purchase an energy efficient appliance. And this, in turn, helps um, us um, achieve our national priorities because it's spurring the energy efficient re uh, efficiency retail market. At the end of the day, he's also saving energy, lessening our demand overall. So, go back to the main point by achieving. Um, national priorities by uh, supporting local decisions. So this is the main premise, uh, the main content strategy that we want um, um, our site uh, to meet. So a couple of big goals um, or, or imperatives within that. First imperative is that we're going to use energy.gov to deliver local services and information to consumers and businesses. So the top level pages of energy.gov are going to be oriented to that specific user. Uh, and this is how it works. So we have a variety of different content types that do, a ver do uh, very specific things. One, they inform. So we have e uh, energy visualizations, technical information, statistics, um, energy definitions that, that inform our users. Two, we can inspire them with success stories um, and projects uh, that are happening in their backyard. Uh, three, we can encourage them to act with energy incentives, NEPA calls to action, social media shareables, contests, challenges, forms. And last but not least, we can give them feedback um, on that action and create this loop of user engagement and the ladder of engagement for our audience. Second imperative for the site, and, and this is a really important one because it, going back to um, all those etch sketches in a jar, this is how we're uh, uh, the vision of, of how we're, we're going to figure out how to serve um, the content needs and the audience needs of all those other of all those other sites that the department owns and manages. And that is, we want to serve specialized audiences through our subsites and affiliate sites. So how does this work? Well, again, at the at top level, energy.gov pages, which are topically oriented rather than organizationally. Um, we are meeting the, uh, the needs of our consumer business audience. So when they search for something on vehicles, they're laying on a page that talks about vehicles. Um, however, we have lots of sub-sites within that content ecosystem that is, uh, that's providing um, uh, more specific information for these niche audiences, for these stakeholders, such as researchers, academics, policymakers, advocates, staff and contractors, press and media, et cetera. Um, and the way that this, this kind of works in the site model is that our digital specialists 
are working with the energy.gov top level pages and curating this content, helping it bubble up from all these different affiliate sites, from our labs, from our program offices, from our staff support offices, from our operations offices, from our administrations, all this organization, which is how our site was originally oriented, is now oriented topically based and we're feeding this information up so the audiences that are looking for it can more easily find it. Third imperative, connect with users where they're already engaged. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically, I know that energy.gov isn't your homepage, um, even though I wish it was. Um, <laughs> and I know not everybody is coming to our website. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, people are, go, are, are finding out about um, ener energy information in other places. So we want to partner with those other popular sites to provide our information in those same places. So for example, it's tax time. Uh, wouldn't it be great when you're filling out your taxes on TurboTax if we also were providing um, our tax incentive information in that same place? Uh, so you're learning about that in a, in a place where you're actually executing upon it. And this also applies to social media. Um, and also uh, in, in talking in the appropriate way um, on our social, uh, in those, uh, to the social media audiences that you're going to get the most bang for your buck. So that's our content strategy. So we have the team. We have... Um, we have what we want to build, now we just need the momentum and the ability to actually get a bunch of people on our side and build it. So one of my favorite things to do these days is in presentation is find a way to incorporate cats on the internet. So when I googled cats and business strategy, this cartoon came up and it was so appropriate. Um, <laughs> so this is my cats on the internet slide. Um, business strategy. Um, sometimes it actually feels like this is what we're doing to accomplish this. So there's a lot of different folks involved in building a web enterprise platform. If you think back to the 359 websites that we, um, that, that we run as a department, um, getting those folks on board uh, requires a, uh, you know, a, a very strong business case. And for us, it's two-pronged. One, we want to eliminate wasteful spending. There's a lot of, um, we, we, uh, there's a lot of web infrastructures, a lot of them um, outdated and not um, meeting our current needs. In addition, maybe uh, a lot of them not in content management systems that we're owning and running. Um, and all of that dupl duplication is expensive. If we pull our resources together, we can get, rather than have a bunch of blah um, platforms, we can create one really awesome one. In addition, it's, it's also about improving digital communications. Also across those 359 sites, it's a wide array of user experiences that makes it really, really confusing for any audience to figure out how to find the information and services that we provide. So by, by, by pulling in um, our content a, into, into a coherent user experience, uh, user experience for our audience, it makes it easy for them and gives them a much more pleasurable um, experience uh, for finding what they're looking for. Now, um, for a lot of folks, this made total sense. They're on board. They're with us. They're, they're you know, where, like, where, where do they sign up? They're ready to go. But at any time that you're trying to do a really large project um, and, uh, and trying to get a lot of people involved and moving a lot of people towards change, there's always going to be a few folks that just, that no matter, no, no matter your argument and no, and no matter how strong it is, aren't, aren't, aren't going to see it. And in those cases, like, I'm sure you've all experienced this. Have you ever wished that there was some ultimate decider that was like, was good, that could come in and save the day for you and get people to join, um, even though you, like, you couldn't do it? Well, in our case, we did have that. The president came to our aid and got our backs. And he um, launched his campaign to cut waste, which was about finding and rooting out um, wasteful spending across the government space. And there was a specific component of that for website reform. And that was looking at the 24 to 25,000 .gov, uh, second level .gov domains that we own and manage and figuring out how to simplify that um, and eliminate that duplication. Um, and so this helped us, this added not only to the, to the rationale for our strong business case, but also gave us an executive order and a higher authority to help, to help push along the initiative. Um, another key component of our business strategy was also developing relationships. And two of the big ones that I want to talk about are le um, is leadership and grassroots. So, of course, leadership is very important. Um, 
And they're important in a way that you want to keep them updated and excited um, and involved, but not so much so that they're micromanaging and telling you what buttons to put on the home page and what logos to put on the home page. So it's a very um, um, it's a very fine line to balance. So we wanted to make sure that they were um, our, our senior leadership was involved as much as possible, but also recognize that we were bringing a special expertise to the table and to get them to trust us uh, to execute accordingly. And fortunately. Well, um, at the Department of Energy, we have a Nobel Prize winning physicist um, on our side, and he kind of gets it. He gets this stuff. He knows that I won't tell him how to do physics, and he's not going to tell me how to do websites. <laughs> um, so we also wanted to build relationships with the folks across the department that are doing this work each and every day. Because at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, it's their day to day. It's their nine to five that's going to be changing. And they need to know what that, what that means and what impact it's going to have on them. So this is a picture of the, the Jedi Council, which is the model for the DOE Web Council. Um, <laughs> Um, um, that we, we, so we, um, working with uh, uh, some of the web and new media staff across the department, we developed the Energy Department Web Council to bring together all these folks who work um, across the department on, on digital uh, strategy and digital communications and technology um, to share best practices and get their guidance um, on our next steps and ha give them a place to have their voices heard. And last but not least, quick wins was a key part of our business strategy. So when starting this project, it became very clear that it was going to take about a year to really do uh, the, uh, the first um, um, build of the site and to launch it. We didn't have a year to show progress. So we, we uh, this is an example of one, of one of the ways that we did this. We incorporated piece of, uh, moments, um, victory moments or quick wins into the process so that, that we, we could show the department I, and a lot of it was internally that there was a, there was a team in place and they were making shit happen. And one of the way and one of the things that we did was we did a reskin of the website um, within six months of of the office being set up. So it was in January of 2011 when we launched this. And really, this wasn't this wasn't a uh, you know a big thing for the public because the information arc, none of the IA changed, no, no new content. Mostly, it was it, it was to win over folks within the department and show them that we knew what we were doing. Um, and to show them that we, we were here and we, and we, and we, can, we, uh, and we could have successes. And this went over with, uh, really well in that regard. In addition, it also got those same folks used to change. So the number of people that emailed Liz Meckes after this launch and said they couldn't find anything on the site, even though we changed none of the content, <laughs> was an astronomical number. Um, so it, it was part of the baby steps to get people ready for the bigger launch where, where information was going to change. Um, and get them okay with that. Um, and there's other places where we've also um, tried to celebrate each like uh, benchmarks in the project um, and have others join us in that celebration to help build um, to help build momentum in the project. So this brings us to Energy.Awesome, which is the site that we have right now. Um, this is the site that we launched um, in August of 2011. That summer, um, we had 11 participating program offices launch with us with 16 affiliate sites. Um, very exciting. Um, in the first six months of launch, we've seen an increase in unique visitors of 328%, which is fantastic. Um, in addition, what, what, what's key about that data is that prior to launch, approximately 42 to 48 percent of our audience was coming from folks within the forestal building of the Department of Energy. 42 to 48 percent of our audience came from within that building. Um, in six months since launch, now just 9 to 12 percent of that audience comes from within that building. And it's not because they're going away and not using the site. No, it's because we're reaching external audiences that we've never reached before. Um, in addition, um, we've also, uh, and I'm sure um, our uh, engineering team uh, we could uh, elaborate on this, we've also been able to contribute several modules back to the community. Um, one to much fanfare has been Bean, which is exciting. Where's Roger? Um, <laughs> um, and data visualization. Um, um, uh, among a couple of others. Um, in addition, the, it's, not, it's not as if we're done. So one of the things that we ran into a, a, uh, from before is that you relaunch a site, you're done, check that box, great, I'm moving on. But what happens is, is the space is so rapidly evolving, evolving that you can't do that. You're never done. So we had to set up a system that we were doing 
it, uh, iterative innovation, continuous innovation. So we are in the uh, phase two of building our Web of Triple platform. Um, phase two means there's nine other program offices by the end of this year um, who will be part of this platform in some way. So that is undergoing. In addition, we're always adding new tools, new features, and, ma and making them accessible to all of those that are part of the platform. Um, and I'm also excited to, t to say that on August, uh, not August, but April 5th, we'll be launching energy.gov slash developer uh, for community like this to provide you specific resources for how to engage and, and partner and work with us with our content. And that will be specifically around apps for energy to get us um, into the mobile space. So I want to take a moment to recap about some of the points that I went over during this presentation. So bottom line, what are some of the things that it takes to you know, build an enterprise um, uh, platform in a .gov environment? So one, laser focus on a clear vision that your team understands. Two, talent. Don't be afraid to think outside the box and look, for, uh, and look in other places to get the team that you need to succeed. Um, three, uh, empowered decision makers with chutzpah. So folks that are willing to make a decision and own it and not be afraid. A user-focused content strategy, organizing your content not based on your organization but based on the topics that people are searching for is very important. Um, having friends throughout the food chain. So from a very top level of the administration all the way down to the folks that are posting press releases for your smallest program office. Um, uh, reach out to all of them. And iterative innovation. Once you launch, you're never done. That's just, that's just, that's just one, one phase. You gotta, you, you gotta keep going. And have a system set up that, um, um, that's built for that. And last but not least, the biggest thing that I think is important, going back to one of my favorite things, the biggest thing that's important um, for uh, building um, an enterprise platform in a .gov environment is, is don't stop believing. Um, it takes a, an immense amount of persistence and willpower um, to, to pull off a large project like this. There are always things that come up that you, uh, that you may not have been aware of, wh whether it's some additional form or rule or regulation or some other requirement that you need to fill, but it's okay. You're going to get through it. <laughs> um, just take the, just have the patience and cross your T's, dot your I's, and you can make it happen. Um, so to, to just be a little cheesy, if you, wait for it, don't stop believing, anything is possible. Um, and that's it. So questions. Oh, and if you're going to ask questions, uh, I've been instructed to ask you to come to the microphone in the middle of the room because this is being recorded to be posted on the web. Don't be shy. How many months or weeks did it take to uh, convert from the whole platform to the new one? If you include um, the, uh, from the very beginning of developing our resource strategy, um, it began in May of, two, of 2010, and we launched our first phase in August of 2011. So we it took us several months just to acquire the team that we needed to pull this off. Uh, two quick, two quick questions. Um, to what extent did you all embrace the Obama administration's open data, open government uh, directive? And the second is, <clears throat> from a support standpoint, how much internal capacity does your team or the department have to support the platform versus how did you outsource and what are the SLAs and how did that strategy work? So two questions, one about um, um, how is this part of the open data, open gov movement, and then also um, the balance of resources between internal versus external. Um, so the um, this is actually energy.gov is one of um, our initiatives that are part of our open government plan for the Department of Energy. So um, thinking back to the three principles of the open uh, open gov initiative: uh, partici um, transparency, participation, and collaboration. Um, this the goal of this is to hit upon all three. And our next. Um, um, uh, we actually are publishing our next round of OpenGov plans uh, come this April. And another part of that is actually going to be our Apps for Energy Challenge, which kind of focuses on the collaboration piece to an extension of that. Um, going back to the question, the second question of internal versus external resources. Um, and others have made, um, <laughs> others across the government space have made a different uh, choice on this than myself. Um, but I, I found it really hard to kind of figure out a way to attract and recruit top-notch engineering talent to work within the federal government and to do so in a quick way. Um, you guys are in hot demand. Um, <laughs> so uh, when it comes to our engineering support um, and, uh, and also our maintenance support, 
All of that is external, but our internal team um, uh, runs content, user experience, and design. Does that help? I had a question about, you mentioned personas. Did you actually do usability studies before and after your implementation? We did. We conducted um, a usability study um, on the initial design. Um, and we have in our, um, with um, actually our, uh, our uh, front end partner and user experience huge actually has a usability center in their offices, uh, which is really helpful um, and got a lot of initial feedback from a you know, wide spectrum and demographics of folks. Um, we also are um, scheduled in our development processes to also do to, uh, a semi-annual usability um, analysis as the platform develops and also make sure that we're also set up to develop um, and improve the platform based on, those, on that feedback. Did you also do the usability studies during those early stages of development before you got to your I don't want to say finished product, but your current site. We all, I want to say no. We only did the one um, after our first after Yeah, our first phase. we find issues with orientation when we go through quick stages like that. So I was just curious. Yep. One of the things that you said in the uh, beginning of the presentation was you were trying to sort of become the next standard, if you will, for government you know, websites and communications digitally. Have you had any other agencies reach out to you and ask, hey, how did you do this, or we really like X, Y, or Z um, after you launched? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I, they kept telling me to repeat the question. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so other agencies reaching out um, to see what we did. Um, yes, uh, we've had a variety of folks reach out, um, especially there's a lot of folks that are also making the move to a Drupal environment and rethinking um, um, their uh, front-end design. Um, so uh, folks from USAID to post office to, I'm part of the Federal Web Managers Council, which includes representatives from across the federal space um, that I've spoken to and give presentations to that council as well. So there's been a lot of, a lot of interest. Hi, my name is Jerry Pan. I'm from uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Hi. So um, yeah, um, very, very good presentation, thank you. Um, I have two questions for you. First one is um, um, I'm working on data related to science research mm -hmm. from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and other uh, government agency. Since you mentioned a couple times that uh, your system can be used for data curation, so the question is, do you think, this is actually a broad question, Drupal as a platform, is that uh, suitable for uh, data curation? Uh, Sci particular science research results or publications. Uh, my second question is, we're trying to push in Drupal usage in our organization. I don't know if you're, again, to share or pushing down experience you have with NH.gov down to the subsidiary like a national labs. Um, can you repeat your first question? I'm not sure, uh, using Drupal for, for data? For data curation. Curating data. Cur curating right? data. Uh, preserving long-term access, that kind of thing. And the other question was adoption of Drupal, right? And yeah, championing pushing, that. Pushing down to subsidiary. Like, <laughs> like, like um, so, you know, a couple of things. Um, I think there's a lot more that we can do um, when it comes to, to data um, on energy.gov. Um, we actually brought on um, someone specifically, this is the best title ever, data integration specialist um, as a full-time person um, in our Office of Digital Strategy to think through the, that, those very questions because I think there's a lot more that we can be doing there. Um, and he's actually the one that is organizing the Apps for Energy Challenge where we'll be putting out um, um, a challenge around green button data, utility data, um, and encouraging developers to develop apps around that um, um, in a couple of weeks. Um, so I think there's a lot more that we could, we could do there and I'm happy to put you in touch with them to get some of your ideas. Um, and the other thing about uh, adoption of, uh, you know, encouraging adoption um, of Drupal um, in, 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 some, in some of our, um, in some of our uh, satellite um, um, offices um, and labs. It's actually, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of labs that are moving in that direction. Right now, Argonne is uh, moving that direction. Um, where's, where's the gentleman from Fermi who was just talking to me about it? Um, there we go. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of others that are exploring this. Um, one thing I will say, one of the big reasons that we 
move, move in this way was you know, because of the flexibility, scalability, and iterative innovation components, but also when the White House made that move and figured out a lot of the security issues and made it, a, it, it helped us make that argument because a lot of the pushback, we weren't getting from a, you know, um, um, a usability or flexibility standpoint, it was uh, making sure the security question um, was addressed. Um, so that helped a long way as well. So um, I'm actually gonna be chatting with the lab communications directors later this week. Um, and I've been given a bunch of presentations about um, um, adoption of Drupal at uh, some of our OpenGov um, um, uh, conferences. So you know, I'm happy to, to talk, talk with anybody at your office to help, help you as well. Hi. Hello again. Uh, this is uh, Stan Asher from JBS International. Uh, my, you had mentioned in your presentation that you had contributed a, a data visualization module back to the community. Um, what module is that? Do you happen to know the name? Can I, can I direct the question to? Yeah, this is Tim from Treehouse. Uh, So it's called Data Visualization API for, for the recording. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Ed Oust from the Alameda County Office of Education in uh, California, in Oakland. I mean Hayward. Um, I loved the video clip you showed, and I was wondering, um, could you say a little more about the process that you had to go through to select an empowered decision maker with chutzpah so that you ended up with an actual stop sign and not, you know, a, 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 an end product that really worked. Well, I think there were, there's a couple, so the question is, is how the process that we, that we put in place to actually have decision making ability. Um, there's kind of two components to that. Um, um, one, um, is like coming into Department of Energy, there was already um, some precedent in understanding that public affairs kind of owned um, logos and public facing design. Um, so the process that um, they had gone through in 2006 um, of having you know a common, so that beautiful design from energy.bla was actually you know, uh, pretty well adopted across the space. Um, so that was already there. Um, and one of the things, and I, I think this is one of the benefits of when you transition from White House to a, you know, a cabinet department, one of the things um, um, that was part of uh, those negotiations coming into the department was I, I needed to be empowered. Um, if they really wanted me to overhaul the web presence and make it better, I needed to be empowered to do so. Um, and be able to have that decision-making authority. Of course, I would make sure that they were involved and I sought their input, but they, they needed to trust me in my experience there. Um, so I, I, at the get-go, I felt that I had that trust um, to be able uh, to say, you know, the buck stops here, this is what we're gonna do. Hi. Hi, I'm Catherine Cool from IQ Solutions. I was really interested in the reskin you did as one of your quick wins. When you did the reskin, did you just uh, change the CSS on the site and kind of move around some uh, some things there, or did you move it into Drupal and then start the redesign in the Drupal space? No, we um, well we had our blog in Drupal because our other CMS, um, which we actually launched um, earlier um, in July, um, uh, because our other CMS couldn't couldn't support a blog. Um, but the the reskin that we did was purely aesthetic. Um, we didn't we did not launch any a, anything on the back end. Cool. Thank you. Hi, Hi. Um, my name is Jeff Bach, and I'm an industry analyst that focuses a lot on Drupal. Uh, Dries has announced that uh, an authoring environment is going to be a major goal for the uh, release of, of uh, D8. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the authoring environments that you currently use within energy.gov. And then the second part of my question is that if you were to make recommendations to Dries and the design community about what needs to be improved in the authoring environment, what would you recommend from the perspective of somebody who deals with a lot of content in the, in the public sector? 
Um, I think it's a great question. And actually, one of the big goals of moving to a single platform was also to um, give us the, uh, the ability to have some consistency and training for the folks who were like to empower communicators to and our subject matter experts across the department um, to be publishing um, to the web and getting their information out there. Now, I, for the specifics of your question um, about the authoring environment now and what we would recommend uh, to Dries, I'm actually going to pitch it to Liz Meckes and Tim from Treehouse. You guys can go ahead and answer. Oh, I should give you guys a microphone. Hi there. Whoa. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that we did, um, uh, Cami mentioned the Bean module. That is one of the things that we did um, to improve the authoring experience. So a lot of what um, the sub offices wanted to do was to be able to aggregate their content easily. And that's something in Drupal you would normally do with views, but the problem with that is that we would be exposing the views, um, views permissions to regular users, which is not really something you want to do. And also it gets cumbersome to continually generate specific views for specific use cases. So we, um, we actually created a module called BEAN, which stands for uh, Block Entities Aren't Nodes, um, which is a, a joke that's funny if you're a programmer, um, but not really to anyone else. And um, what that allows you to do is um, basically generate blocks um, custom blocks um, and to have user permissions on them that are more restricted. So uh, we tried to do, we tried to basically um, empower the user without giving them permission to destroy the site. And so the bean was one of the things that we did. Um, I'm trying to think of other good examples. A lot of the, um, the content, the content is basically structured with organic groups. Um, and that helps each end of, I, am I still on? No. Um, well, I've got a big voice, I can talk. Um, so, um, I won't be on the video. Oh. Okay. Cammie, I'm gonna Here, you wanna try this? Yeah. Here, wait, wait, Megan. Oh, sorry about that. So, um, we use organic groups to allow the individual sub offices to own their content without polluting or interfering with any of the other offices content or the top level energy.gov content. We came up with a system, however, that allows us to also cross post that content between the different organic groups so that if the, um, the Office of Indian Energy, say, has an article that the Office of, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, uh, let's say general counsel, because that's one that I can remember. Um, if general counsel finds a piece of content that an Indian energy made that they want to use, um, we have a system for them to, to allow that content to be posted over there. Um, so those are two things that we did. Does that help answer your question at all? Yeah, that does answer for the current. Now, what would you recommend to uh, the D8 design community uh, in terms of requirements that they should have? Um, lots and lots of user experience testing. Uh, I know this was already done. Um, one thing that we've started to do um, in our development process, especially when we're doing ongoing maintenance, is uh, I talk to some of the users. I actually have a weekly meeting set up with uh, the woman who is basically the front line in educating these people on how to use the system, and she's the one that hears all the complaints about how the system is hard to work with. And so we meet with her weekly. Um, I explain to her new features that we've dropped in in this production cycle, and she tells me what they're having difficulty with. It's sort of an informal, ongoing UX testing. But in terms of recommendations to um, Drupal 8, um, I, a lot of UX testing, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I think we have time for just the last couple of folks in line for questions. Hi, my name is Boris. Uh, just retrospectively, do you think you could have done something a little bit different, you know, looking back at it right now in the beginning? I'm, so, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you say that again? Do you think there's something you would like to do retrospectively, uh, like to do from the beginning? Now you guys sort of... Something that we would redo? Yeah. Um, you know, that's really, uh, it's, it's a great question. I think... Um, if we could allow allowed for more time to educate 
um, and bring up the, you know, the, our first 11 partners with the program office, uh, our 11 program offices. If we had, um, if we were able to have more resources and more one-on-one -on -one time with each of them to get them ready um, for our first phase launch, I think that was a, it was a big thing. We've, we've adjusted that in the, with our second phases to give them more time. Um, um, but in a project like this where you need to, sometimes you just need to rip off the Band-Aid um, to, you know, to, to, to get folks to focus and, and meet a deadline, um, it was hard to do that. But I think going back, we would have done a lot more education and um, sit down to, uh, with those folks to, to, to make the experience um, um, a, little, a little easier for them. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Schwassen from ACEEE. And uh, I wanted to ask you real quick about content, um, and specifically how you uh, had to change the workflow for um, your employees to get content onto the website, if at all, and, and whether that process was streamlined or, or changed at all. Thank you. Well, I mean, there, there's so much evolution that happened over the course of the project. When we started, um, um, there were two folks that were kind of working on content for the site um, in you know, the basement of uh, the Forestal Building of the Department of Energy that I you know, brought up to the seventh floor um, and had to focus on, okay, um, uh, what are we gonna what are we, what are we gonna say um, on energy.gov today? But we want, didn't have an environment that allowed for dynamic content. So the, one of the first things we did was you know launch a, um, uh, attach a blog in Drupal onto the energy main energy.gov site and start generating that content and get the department the department didn't, never had a you know a central energy.gov blog before. So get the department used to working with that and thinking uh, you know, about another communication avenue that they could use to reach the public and then building it from there. Um, so, and also we didn't have a big team. So now we have five, um, five folks on our editorial team. There's one managing editor um, and four specialists that focus on specific energy issue areas so they can develop a subject matter expertise with working with some of our offices. So um, there's a lot of, off and also breaking down some of our silos, there's a lot of offices that work on solar, for example. Well, that um, content specialist is responsible for working across, across that organization to curate content in a way that's gonna be the most effective for our consumer um, and business audience. And that kind of works, work, works itself out in some other issue areas. And some issue areas, uh, like, and, uh, like environmental management, there's one office that does that, and that one's a little easier. <laughs> but in some of, our, some of our others where it's cross-cutting, we wanted to structure our, our editorial team in a way to kind of break down those organizational structures because people aren't searching for information by the Office of Electricity and Reliability Office. They're searching it, they're typing in smart grid. Um, um, so that's, that's, I don't know if that quite answers your question, um, but we, we've had quite an evolution um, um, with not just, not just the site itself, but also support the, the team supporting that over, over the last two years. All right, um, well, thank you guys all for coming um, to my session. Um, they asked me to put up this slide so you can give me some feedback um, so we can improve for next time. And um, have a great rest of the week at DribbleCon. Thanks.